Hello, I'm the Earthly Cartographer, and this is the history of Clarksburg. Within the Fallout universe, the city of Clarksburg, West Virginia, is one of the two municipalities within the region known after the war as the Toxic Valley. In this video, I'm going to go over the histories of the real-world version, and then the in-game version of Clarksburg. I will outline the differences between the two versions of the city, and talk about how Clarksburg ended up in the state it is in when we, the dwellers of Vault 76, come across it in 2102. When I created my What Happened to Grafton video, I came to realize just how jumbled the map of Appalachia is in the Fallout universe when compared to the real world. A quick recap. Real world Clarksburg lies about 17 miles west-southwest of Grafton. The in-game versions of the towns are effectively switched. Both of these cities lie west-southwest of Morgantown on tributaries of the Monongahela River that flow north through Morgantown. This layout is completely switched in the in-game version, where Morgantown is east-southeast, and the Monongahela flows south. When I started my research into Clarksburg, I came to realize it's not just the geography that's jumbled. While in-game Grafton is the larger of the two, and the center of the valley that became the Toxic Valley, real-world Clarksburg has, for almost its entire history, been a larger, more populous city than Grafton. At times, Clarksburg has hosted four times the population of Grafton, and even today has approximately 15,480 people, about three times Grafton's estimated 5,040. But let's get into real-world Clarksburg. Clarksburg lies at the convergence of Elk Creek and the West Fork River. The earliest settlement of the area that became Clarksburg was by people of the Hopewell culture sometime early in the first millennium. The Hopewell culture is more of an archaeological term used to refer to groups of people rather than to a specific tribe. The unfortunate thing about trying to study societies in this part of North America from that time is that they didn't leave much in the way of documentation behind. And most of what we have to go on is the burial mounds they constructed. These mounds are why these people are referred to as mound builders, and Clarksburg is home to the Oak Mounds, a pair of burial mounds just outside of town. Jumping ahead centuries, the first Europeans entered what was at the time Iroquois hunting ground in the 1760s. These early Europeans were trappers trading with the local natives. One of these trappers was John Simpson, who in 1764 camped on the West Fork River, just across from the mouth of the Elk Creek, a spot that is today west of downtown Clarksburg, and potentially home to a used car lot. In 1772, permanent settlers began to arrive. In 1773, Daniel Davison claimed 400 acres of land that underlies much of modern Clarksburg. The population began to grow, and the town eventually was incorporated by the Virginia General Assembly in 1785, and named for General George Rogers Clark, a Virginian officer in the Revolutionary War. In 1786, a road that ran from Westchester, Virginia, to Morgantown began its extension to Clarksburg. Clarksburg would eventually be connected via the Northwest Turnpike to Grafton in the 1830s, and that path would eventually become part of US-50, a pre-interstate highway route that runs from Sacramento, California to Ocean City, Maryland. In 1787, the first Harrison County Courthouse was constructed in Clarksburg. There have been several replacement courthouses, but the current Depression-era courthouse has been in Clarksburg since 1932. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad reached Clarksburg from recently incorporated Grafton in 1856, driving additional growth. Just as much of West Virginia exemplifies the brother-against-brother brother fighting in the Civil War, Harrison County both voted against Virginia's secession and provided the Confederacy with one of its greatest generals, Stonewall Jackson, who was born in Clarksburg in 1828. General McClellan met his headquarters near Clarksburg until the First Battle of Bull Run, and Clarksburg was a frequent target of Confederate raiders, but it never came under attack in that time. In 1861, after voting against secession, Harrison County Delegate John S. Carlyle became a leader of the Wheeling Convention that proclaimed the Confederate state government illegitimate. The restored government of Virginia, as the Wheeling government called itself, would eventually become the government of West Virginia when it was admitted to the Union on June 20, 1863. In 1877, Clarksburg was beaten out by Charleston in the vote to select a new state capital, but thanks to its wealth of natural resources and location on the Trans-Appalachian Railroad, industry started taking off. In the mid-1880s, Clarksburg was the first city in the state to have telephone service. Water lines were laid in 1887, and electric lights lit the street in 1889. Around the turn of the century, population boomed with the annexation of neighboring towns and immigration that included a large contingent of Belgians who left political oppression in flagging factories to manufacture glass in Appalachia. The first car reached Clarksburg in 1902, driving further development of the region. Many of Clarksburg's historic downtown structures are products of the economic boom in the area in the early 20th century, a boom that ended in 1929 with the arrival of the Great Depression that broke many of the banks in the region. The population of Clarksburg peaked around that time at 35,000, but declined sharply to 28,866 for the 1930 census. The population rose again into the 1950s, before declining with every census since. Luckily for the people of modern Clarksburg, many of the boom era buildings have been protected and preserved. Though industry has declined over the decades, in July 1995, the FBI opened its Criminal Justice Information Services Division complex in Clarksburg. Just over a year later, in October 1996, the FBI arrested seven men with a Mountaineer militia that plotted to blow it up. But that's most of what I could find on real-world Clarksburg. So let's get to in-game Clarksburg. 
There's a dearth of primary sources on in-game history of pre-war Clarksburg, both on and off-site. There is in fact only one holotape to be found in Clarksburg and that relates entirely to the post-war period. Therefore, we have to take in the full expanse of the geography of the city, both natural and human. Before getting into exclusively in-game information, I, I will note in terms of shared features, in-game and real-world Clarksburg share really nothing other than generally hilly terrain. First, like I detailed earlier, real-world Clarksburg lies at the junction of the West Fork River and Elk Creek. There is no such junction here in-game. Second, while Clarksburg in-game has a lakefront area, real-world Clarksburg's closest lake is 17 miles away at Tiger Lake, the analog of in-game Grafton Lake. But that's enough of the similarities and differences, so let's get back to in-game Clarksburg. Within the Fallout universe, Clarksburg is home to 10 homes, apartments, a trailer park, a hardware store, a grocery store, a tattoo parlor, a theater, a gun store, an auto shop, a shooting range, a sporting goods store, a crab shack, a bar and grill, a cafe, a post office, a police station, and a church. Clarksburg appears to have made its money from a combination of heavy industry and tourism. In terms of heavy industry, the largest employer in the valley seems to have been Grafton Steel. In terms of tourism, much of the area surrounding the lake that Clarksburg lies on, a lake that I'm going to refer to as Clarksburg Lake in this video, is covered with tourist draws. On the southwestern side of Clarksburg Lake, the Clarksburg side, you can find boathouses, the aforementioned sporting goods store, crab shack, bar and grill, and cafe, all of these accessible from the boardwalk. A short distance further in on this side, you can find the Clarksburg Shooting Range. A popular site before the end came, and a source of weapons after. The northern end of Clarksburg Lake is home to Wavy Willard's Water Park. The eastern end of the lake hosts the scouting-related Kitty Corner Cabins. Slightly further inland on the east side, you find Black Bear Lodge, a popular hunting resort that hosted seasonal travelers. On the south end of the lake, you can find typical lakefront amenities. In boat launches, picnic areas, lounge chairs, and even a small pool that appears to have been free to the public. Whether these sources had sufficed to keep the city financially healthy in past years, we don't know, but before the bombs, Clarksburg was already in upheaval. Clarksburg stands out amongst its neighbors in being the only northern Appalachian city to appear to have had mass anti-automation riots. And I say riots, not protests, because of the state of the city of Clarksburg. Every road in and out of town is blocked with barricades ranging from a van straddling the road, to a rolled truck on Main Street, to constructed barricades, all hosting signs with anti-automation slogans. Clarksburg appears to have been well on its way to becoming the war zone that the southern town of Beckley was. It could be the case that nearby Grafton, with its similar economy, would have faced similar circumstances but for the suppressive actions of the office of the mayor. The state of Clarksburg seems to have become chaotic fairly quickly in the run-up to the bombs as Otis Pike, the whistleblower of Grafton Steel, attempted to send a letter to Charleston Herald investigative reporter Quinn Carter on October 17, 2077, stating that he had stashed important information in a Clarksburg post office box for her. Had Miss Carter attempted to extract this information from the post office, she would have come face to face with the barricades. These protests were likely related to the automation taking place within the largest employer in the region, Grafton Steel. I've detailed the actions of Grafton Steel, its owner Arthur Wood, HR manager Stacey Tibbetts, saboteur Darius Angler, and whistleblower Otis Pike in previous videos, so I won't delve too deeply into it here. Grafton Steel was an important part of the U.S. war effort against the Communist Chinese, and thus was granted preferred war contractor status by the government, granting it the capacity to ignore most environmental regulations and labor laws. The legally overworked and underpaid staff of the mill began to be replaced by robots. While workers at the plant destroyed their new robotic co-workers, their families and now replaced co-workers protested and rioted back home. Jobs weren't the only things being lost as pollution being emitted from the mill killed children in the valley. The discontented Clarksburgers may have protested at the doorstep of the source of their discontent had the governor not kicked them off the mill property and installed armed guards. The operation of the mill threatened not only the health of the workers and their families, but the environment of tourism in the region. As the bombs fell at 9.47 on Saturday, October 23, 2077, Darius Angler, a former Grafton Steel chemist who lost his brother in an industrial accident, injected a chemical into the mill equipment, causing it to rain white particulate pollution across the valley at large, toxifying the region. In Clarksburg, the survivors that decided to stick out the bombs in town looted guns from the local shooting range and dug in. Within days, down came the space station Valiant, embedding itself in the hills east-northeast of Clarksburg, where it began to spill a highly radioactive liquid into the environment. This radioactive liquid infiltrated the local water table, where the radiation turned the countryside into a geyser field as radiation-heated water burst forth as steam. 
The residents of Clarksburg watched as the lake changed color and began to glow at night. This is powdery white poison fell from above. Sinkholes opened in much of the north end of town, including a trailer park and the police station, subsisted into the warm, wet, radioactive sludge. Many of the locals that stuck out the bombs decided it was time to move on, leaving just three behind. Soon, two of those three were dead in a bear attack, leaving Cooper Lou as the final remaining survivor of Clarksburg. This appears to have been the last time anyone settled the area until we exited the vault in 2102, as there is no evidence of post-war occupation of the area by the responders of the raiders. The Black Bear Lodge is filled with post-war creature heads, meaning they operated in some capacity post-war. Though they didn't establish an outpost there, the responders built a scorched beast trap in the area east of town in the closing years before the scorching of Appalachia. Because of the quick abandonment of Clarksburg and the subsequent burial in Angler's Ash, it reminds me somewhat of Pompeii, and it allows us to get a closer look at what the city was like before the war. Places like Morgantown and Grafton may have been altered by post-war occupation. Clarksburg is the closest we get to seeing how an average town in the area was dealing with the rapidly changing world. But I think that's going to do it for Clarksburg. This has been the Earth's Cartographer. If you want to see more, hit the subscribe button. If you liked it, hit the like button. If you have any comments or questions, leave them for me and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.